Good evening, Mike. Hey, how's it going? Yeah, turn up my volume so I can hear you. <clears throat> okay. So I just was uh, listening to uh, a friend of yours, Bob Lazar. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was being interviewed by Joe Rogan back in 2019. Oh, and, 19. Oh, geez, that's pretty recent. Yeah, evidently they re that that same year, there 2018, they came out with a film with Bob Lazar and Area 51. The guy made up, and and then all yeah. these reports about the Air Force seeing these things zipping around the sky came out at the same time. And so he's pretty much kind of uh, been. <laughs> Uh, what do you call it um, a local justified. ufo yeah yeah so um, he, he was saying that these ufos were uh, somehow the, the gravity they had reverse gravity and they'd make this shield around them with that and so there'd be no inertia for this thing for anybody inside the spacecraft they could just fly around like that sounds pretty amazing but it would match up and he said some of these things they these spacecraft they, he said there was like nine of them at the sr4 area that could uh, be actually from archaeological digs that you know people dug them up they weren't you know something shot down recently so some of the spacecraft that they had yeah well i uh, i don't know cool. what i don't know what to think i keep my mind open uh with a little healthy dose of skepticism so mm -hmm. uh but uh, anyway, yeah, check, check out that interview. It's Joe R Rogan, uh, episode okay. thir 1315, I think. OK. And you can find that on YouTube. I think, it, yeah, YouTube. If you saw it. OK. But yeah, pretty, pretty neat. Uh, evidently, they tried to remove all his records of school and when he got caught for observing uh, the ufo with his friends yeah one time yeah he's in his 20s at 1989 i guess yeah that'd be late, about right late 20s yeah 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 let's see i was let's see i was born 53 so 83 would be 30 years i'd be in my late 30s yeah i knew him uh, <clears throat> interesting guy what, what company did you, know, did you know him from? Well, originally um, it was Zincom and then become, it became, uh, it was a, a Mason and, uh, Mason and Plummer, I, I believe. It's been so many years. Um, and then it became uh, uh Fairchild memory test systems and then Schlumberger memory test systems. At about that time, he had left uh, into that a little bit with his wife. Um, I uh, originally it was just one in one 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 building, and then they split it up. And they it, it, this is how management does stupid things. They split up the company into two parts, manufacturing and engineering. And in a company like that, it's very important to uh, keep things together. So uh, things went a little haywire. Oh, oh, and then when we became also Schlumberger, we actually moved to Simi Valley on Voyager Street, Voyager. <laughs> <laughs> uh, off the, uh, where the, uh, uh, near where the uh, uh, Pepper Tree Lane is, uh, very close to the uh, entrance of uh, Brandeis Bardeen Institute. And it's now a, a bank place, uh, but uh, um, it was a really nice building and had a, a walking track and a, a, a really nice uh, 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 cafeteria and all that and uh uh you know, things went south uh basically what they did was ibm at the time got really big into the thing we need to we need to get memory and we need uh basically dynamic rams were not very big they were like 4k um they were starting to finally come out with the 64k by one chips which really broke open 
uh, microcomputers. Um, the the uh, Commodore 64 was like one of the first ones to use those chips. But anyways, um, the, uh, IBM says, well, we'll we're going to buy a thousand testers from you to test our new bubble memory technology. And they we basically took off our brightest and sharpest people to go and design testers for these bubble memories, which were the size of matchboxes. I think that's um, what I had in my TI-59 calculator, had bubble memory. What did it? Mistake. Yeah, no, I, I'm not sure about that, but it, it could be. But the, the bubble memory proved to be hard to use. First, it required a lot of power, a lot of circuitry. That, um, that was hard. Um, it wasn't logic voltages. It was these weird wide swing voltages because they needed to go and generate electric magnetic fields to move the little bubble, bubbles and um, sequence. And the other thing was that the bubble memory really was more, nothing more than a, a data shift register, a serial in, serial out. And it didn't have all that much speed. And so for like these one megabit bubble memories, if you lost, you know, it would go around in a circle. If you lost it at the wrong time, you'd have to wait for a million bits to go around before you get to that data again. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, so they- Well, so it's kind of like good for read-only memory, but you never change it. it well, no, it, 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 it really was not even good for that because you want to be able to access the data right away. And with a bubble memory, you had to wait till the data got shifted around. And so um, they also had to have circuitry to um, fix, um, uh, fix bit errors because it wasn't always perfect. So they had a lot of this auxiliary circuitry that went into it to, to make sure that the bubbles, real. the bubbles probably escaped every once in a while too. Yeah. Well, let's <laughs> just say everybody was really gun hole on it until the bubble burst. <laughs> and I think, I think the term, the bubble burst, uh, for like, uh, you know, uh, you know, for technology, probably came from the the fact that uh, IBM spent so much money on this. And it turned out to be a dog and they walked away from it. In the meanwhile, Schlumberger Memory Test Systems um, invested so much time and money that they lost out on the real markets, which was low cost memory testers and high performance memory testers for static RAMs and other things. And so there was a downturn and I got laid off. Um, oh. And uh, um, along with a lot of other people, um, I might add. And eventually they moved, they, they sold the building, moved into a small place. And then eventually uh, Slumberger said, eh, oh, this technology stuff is too much trouble. We make most of our money in oil anyway. So um, they folded the company. Interesting. Along with, along with whatever retirement benefits I had that I never got to take take advantage of. Well, weird, weird. Yeah. yeah that's not nice. Yeah. So, um, Hank, you there? Yeah. Okay, so uh, just to let you guys know that I was able to test out on one or two pictures with my camera with the off-axis guider. Mm -hmm. All right. And guess what? No trailed stars. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. So, uh, and then I how took this out. You, how long was the exposure? Um, I try. I uh, the the initial one was uh, four minutes, mm -hmm. and um, then I tried going for ten minutes, and for whatever reason, sharp cap didn't like that, and I spent 
uh, the rest of the night trying to get sharp cap to go and take 10 minute exposures, which would have really uh, verified. So um, that was just before, that was the night before we had to go down south, which we actually went by you guys on the way back. Um, had uh, needed to visit my mom and oh, uh, where's she, where's your mom live? Kanoka Park, yeah. Roscoe and Topanga, that area. So, uh, um, yeah. So the guy, the guiding, did you use PhD too? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and with the off-axis guider with an SCT, you're not going to get nice round stars because it's so far off to the side that you get a little bit of uh, distortion, but it tracked okay. So you mean the, the off-axis guider does not give you round stars? Is that what you're saying? Yes, because with an SCT, if you're off too far to the side, it's got its own curvature, field of curvature. Okay. Yeah, I've also noticed that sometimes I get uh, elongated stars with my off-axis guider. Yeah. And it turned out it was just a matter of uh, focusing. So you probably have some helical focus around there. Yeah. Just, no, just to, no, this is try, with try the, that again. This is with yeah. the helical focuser. So right, right. But 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 try refocusing because that yeah. may actually fix it. I because I had uh, you know it made a big difference. And the nice thing is once you have focused it, then it stays in focus because it's part right. focal. Right. Yeah. So I I probably could improve that enough, but it was good enough that it was uh I was getting plenty of stars. Um I got the ESI uh 120 uh little camera. Oh, I don't want to take it out because it'll change the focus. Uh, but it's it's it looks like an eyepiece, a red eyepiece, yeah. and so that um, even though it's got its older technology, it's more than sensitive enough for uh, an auto guider. Okay. I mean, there's a newer newer ones using the like the 178 or the 248 where yeah. they have they're even better lower noise, but this one's. I find, you know, is the one, is, do you have the 120? Yeah, the 120 okay, MM. Yeah, that, that works fine for me too, yeah. Yeah. So, I, so I'm going to have to go come in and out because um, I'm trying to run um, my 2600 MC on a Raspberry 2 Pi and uh, Pi 2 and it doesn't work. It just uh, hangs every time I try to download an image. This is the first time I do that. So oh. I'm going to have to go back to the Pi 4B. So I... I have that on a bigger rig, bigger rig, and I just wanted for the, the AstroCat, for which I would like to have a smaller rig, but unfortunately, it uh, can't do Again, it what cameras are you using with that? Uh, the 2600 MC. Okay. And I was hoping to be able to have your, uh, you know, the, the AstroCat with a Pi 2B and uh, the the big gun with the mono camera with the 4B, but uh, apparently, uh, it's uh, not well, good. Well, that I, looks I like another 50. $50 purchase is in order, huh? Yeah, well, that's okay. It's um, the Pi 4B is a, pretty amazing, actually. So, a whole second. Oh, yeah, 4B Pi. Yeah, that's got what, four gigs? So, you got the eight gigs. I got the eight gig. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's got quite a bit of power. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Too I was bad. able to use that with the other camera that I had. Uh, it, it seemed to work pretty good. Um, so, the Pi 4B? I've got the no three uh three I got a three, okay three yeah that, that's that's already more powerful than what I have but yeah the two yeah fine. If, I, if I use a DSLR it works fine but uh, yeah, yeah. I, that's what I was using now that the twenty six hundred that's an APS-C size sensor right or is that the full size no it's APS-C size yeah yeah, yeah no full that's size I don't I don't have that but uh, I also don't want to have it because the, my filters are small enough and. The coma corrector, the, the paracore, if you run it with a full frame, then you get way, I already get quite a bit of vignetting in the corners. It can just barely mm. do it. Um, so yeah, no, mm. this is good for me. Mm. All right. So, so, so if you have yeah. vignetting in the corners, you just, you just make sure your pictures come out in circles. You just ignore the corners, you know, don't. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Of course, you pay for the 2600 uh, to, to, to use it whole <laughs> frame. Yes. It's kind of silly, but uh, no, I can. But uh, you know, uh, taking some uh, some flat sticks care of it. But you can tell this 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 paracore coma corrector is a really a long tube, 
and so it does have vignetting. It's a very great, it's a great, uh, you know, coma corrector, but uh, yeah. I'm thinking about getting uh, the Bader uh, MPPC. Um, that's the one that they actually recommend using with this camera, believe it or not. So, yeah, I have that one too. I've got a Bader MK3 MPPC, yeah, but it's not, not great. So yeah, I got this one because I want the, you know, the 12 inch newt with an F4, you, you need something good. And I wanted this to be a good rig. So I just decided yeah. not to compromise here. So I have very little vignetting with my setup with uh, the uh, C11. And that's using a two inch focuser with two inch filters and a electric focuser on the back end, which kind of extends things out a little bit, but uh, it's got a little, a tiny bit, but uh, you know, hey, uh, okay, we'll let you see, let you get out there. Yeah, I'll have to swap my gear. Okay. See you later. Okay. No worries. Yeah, so that kind of un unscrews and would go directly into uh that would screw directly into my um off-axis guider so really this is this is a two inch yeah, yeah. so you, you put it in line with your main camera the off-axis guider yes yeah yeah okay yeah and that looks like you can is it a helical focusing here or uh i think they put that on there. Um, what's very critical oh, no. is the, um, the field flattener to the surface of the sensor that you're taking pictures with. And ASI, I mean, Q QHY um, designed it for the back, proper back focus with all the gizmos you put together. So uh, um, they, they kind of specify that. So uh, I might be getting that. Well, this oh. says, uh, it says large lenses for completely vignetting free exposures up to F3.5. Right. So how does that work with an F10 uh, SCT? Well, that's 3.5, but they don't specify how big the sensor is. I expect to lose something off the edge when I go to a super fast, just because of, uh, you know, going through a focuser and all that. Um, but again, that's with, uh, if they got it on a camera and if it's a full frame camera, then I'm okay. So, uh, Multi-purpose coma corrector. That's right. Yeah. So getting the spacing to the sensor is very critical. Now what? the the one that uh, that um, Jerry loaned me, which is the Row Ackerman. I mean, it's not the Row Ackerman. It's the Row, which is made by Bader, is very difficult to use because. If evidently the design is much more critical as far as front back spacing. That's this one right here. Well, let me let me get zoom in on that. Hold on for a sec. Okay, hold a second. And I can do speaker view. Okay. Make some noise, Mike. RC one, RCC one. I see. RCC one, right there. So um, that. Instead of 55 millimeters, I guess, this requires like, like close to four inches, which is really a long distance. So um, it's difficult uh, to get the proper uh, distance. Good news in a, uh, on a different front. Just to... Guess what I received on my front porch? Uh, Amazon box. What? <laughs> And guess what was in it? Uh, what was in your Amazon box? I the can't replacement remember. part for my dome and a dome cover and oh, whoa. oh, so, so not, not not from Amazon. <laughs> well, now from Next Dome. Yeah, Next Dome. 
That's great. So, so, so I'll probably have to, it was, it was free, but I'll probably have to pay duties on the value, which is three ninety nine. So whatever that is. But what do you um, mean? Where, where is it coming from? It's coming from Quebec. Oh, well, yeah. wouldn't they charge you that uh, up front that that cost? No, no, not in this case. Nope. But hey, I'm getting a, a cover for free and um, the one thing they didn't send was the gasket. They promised me a gasket, but I'm working on that to get the doors uh, watertight. So um, find, a, find a garage door gasket somewhere. Yeah, something Wonder. like that. Yeah, to uh, another gasket over the other gasket. It, it the, the door needed to really to be in set so there was a lip over it so that the rain wouldn't come in so mm -hmm. i'm gonna i'm gonna make that the and it seems like the only thing that's going to stick to it and i'm having a hard time getting it off uh is hot milk glue <laughs> oh boy so, so i can if i can rig up something with hot milk glue you know it'll be a happy camper that will uh keep the rain mm. off so you're talking about the cover piece just over the door area it, it's like a yeah, section the, the, yeah the door kind of the door actually is thinner is is smaller than the actual opening of the door and what they did was they relied on this big thick gasket that came out was sort, sort of like a a, a a round uh you know gasket you know sort of like this here um to for the door to push against and also it was larger and so um things didn't line up and the shape of the door the the bow of the door with respect to the bow of the um dome part okay is not the same yeah it's right there that black part no with the doors that black circle. Yeah. Okay. That's your so gasket. That's the gasket. That makes the hole smaller than the door. So it presses against there. But they so, gave you this piece right here that cracked? Yes. Yeah. So I'll be replacing that tomorrow. Very good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Rain's going to come. Oh, yeah. It it yeah. it did did a little bit, uh, you know. I I've had a cover over my scope stuff, so it's funny that, uh, like you say, you can see the the gasket area there. Yeah. yeah, right. It's supposed to be a little bit. It and that's the. It's sort of like a. Here's the dome part, the the wall, and the and and the gasket fits over it. It slides over it. Okay. Uh. And so um, the round part is lower, it makes the whole size smaller, and then it's supposed to push out and get proper. Yeah. Looks a lot bigger there than it is. <laughs> in my... Well, oh, a whole second. Okay, that's a refractor with a small, uh, yeah. sm a small equatorial mount. It doesn't have the behemoth Misu. Uh, 200 with its the misu has an enormous counterweight bar it's the longest counterweight bar that i know of and uh so that really swings out and the on the other side of the of the pole you know the the, the offset is kind of large too it's a it's a real industrial you know duty uh mount um substantial I mean, this here, um, that almost looks like a Takahashi or something similar, or, you know. Um, Hard to see. Yeah, or, or one of the Chinese mounts, like an EQ6 or something like that. They're relatively small. Looks like this guy. Looks like a plastic bucket that's been turned upside down and filled with concrete or something. <laughs> uh, well, it's the form. Yeah, it's the form. 
And I really need to do that with mine, but uh, my wife doesn't want me to dig a hole. Break no, that's the concrete. too. Yeah. Oh well. You'll have to. You'll have to convince her somehow that you need that. Yeah. So you're just. I mean, you're on a wooden platform too, aren't you? Or, or no, your does your scope go down to? It goes just below the platform patio? onto the concrete patio. Okay. But and you, the platform and is designed to hang over and um it's 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 designed to not press directly where the telescope is to to insulate it from vibrations oh, I, see. I see yeah and your and your mount is it's bolted to that concrete patio concrete whatever no it's resting firmly on there um that mm -hmm. central part there i've got like a a seven inch steel pipe which itself weighs about 80, 90 pounds. And with the feet um, weighs probably well over a hundred pounds. And uh, with the mount on top, hey, Jerry, um, weighs yet another 50 pounds with the telescope and all that. You know, we're, we're talking about a good two to 300 pounds, you know, sitting on there. So, um i don't think it's moving i pound on that the the um i pound on the uh wooden platform here no the pier okay. and it's it's pretty solid it hurts my hand so <laughs> jerry i got the i i got in the uh the replacement part for the for the dome and the cover oh good so your leak is done no i have to fix it now oh okay but, but i put i put um i put duct tape well, metallic duct tape on the uh that section there and it's kept water from coming in so okay good yeah so tomorrow i'll be fixing that mm -hmm. just in time for the big rains i'm ready well all Is your there... stuff's inside isn't it what's that isn't all your stuff inside or? Yeah, it's inside the house. Yeah, right. That's not in use. Yeah. And I was, I was telling uh, the other guys that I got my off-axis guider working with my QHY um, scope. Excellent. Yeah. And so I was doing four-minute exposures with completely round stars. Okay, good. So... Yeah. So the, the, the only thing was, and I have my friend Mark says I should buy the Sky X because I was having the issues um, getting it to perform exposures with the uh, um, sh um, sh sh sharp cap for 10 minutes. So I was trying 10 minutes, but it seemed like it was hanging up for whatever reason. Okay. So I was I was gonna really try and test it. You know that would have been the real acid test, right? Ten minutes. That's much longer than you would want to, you know, take an exposure for under most circumstances. Mm -hmm. Well, except for maybe with a nice narrow filter, and then that's probably too short, anyways. <laughs> so no, I tend to take six minute subframes. Mm -hmm. so uh, uh what's the sky x going to do for you oh it's gonna it's gonna cost me a hundred dollars a year i'm not sure if i'm into that uh, i'm i'm not sure if i really wanted to get into that plus a sign up fee 229 sign up fee yeah i know yeah really kind of so oh, i have i have it complete i'm not subscribed i have one of the last versions of it that's fully installed on your machine so it, i just got the cd for it yeah it's a wonderful program yeah but it's more money i want to spend yeah well that's possible that's I'd like get it either if i had to subscribe to it yeah yeah, really. And let's see, two twenty nine in two years, you'd be spending close to a, 
the 229, that's $400. So Hank, you better show us how to go and use those wonderful free programs that you put on your Raspberry Pi. Yeah, okay. just, 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 just get an ECOS, it's free and it also controls your observatory. So don't yeah. worry about it. Yeah. Of course, I've never tried it, but uh, you know, supposedly it can do it. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I've 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 tried ECOS, and you know it, it does control things. Um, yeah. But that was only with a DLSR, not with a a QHY. Yeah. And it, I, it works fine with yeah with the twenty six hundred. It works fine too. So I can you know have a guide scope and a twenty six hundred. Oh, that's and... right. Your only problem is that you're trying to get away with some old hardware you didn't want to throw away. So you know. What old hardware? Your your Raspberry Pi two. Oh yeah, well I just got uh, I just swapped it for the Pi four B. So yeah, I'm gonna probably get another Pi four B if I. Yeah. Although you know, if you do just one thing at a time, then one is enough actually. <clears throat> yeah. So. so it says Ecos is part of K Stars. Yes. So K Stars, if you bring that up, it it's the planetarium program. Yeah. And uh, right. it's got a little icon that says ECOS, and that's how you bring it up. And the, my my only my only um, criticism of uh, the the K stars is that the planetary program could look a little nicer. The the stars are yeah. kind of like minuscule. Yeah. Um, True, but you know, I don't, I don't use it a whole lot, and it's it's adequate. Let's put it that way. Yeah, uh, and I think you can make it nicer because there are some buttons that you can uh, change the GUI with, but it's definitely good enough. Um, yeah, I just use it to navigate, and for that, it's just fine. Then you don't want to have too much, uh, too many bells and whistles on there anyway. Right. Yeah. But in my experience, it's not really a, a big issue. I, I agree. I mean, aesthetically, uh, Sky Safari is so much prettier, or or Stellarium. But um, given that this is everything in one, and it's actually good, it's got a good user community, and um, yes, it does quality. It's it's it really works well. So yeah, yeah. What's the bunny rabbit uh, icon for? In K stars. Oh, good question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, see. I know, I know what it is. They probably show you all the creatures in the sky with the overlays. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's got all the, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, Art, I can show artwork. you. Constellation artwork, yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, can you see it? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Hold on. I got to stop share so you can see it. Uh, okay. There, there yeah, we go. Yeah, so this is Constellation artwork. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the Pi 4B can uh, now manage the <laughs> the pictures, actually. Although there's not much in the picture, I have to check if there are clouds actually, because this is this doesn't look all that. Uh -huh. The other day I did much better. I have I, I now have the, uh, uh, the filter on it, the um, L enhance filter. Um, so I want to try that. That will make your exposures. That will cut down on your light throughput. Yeah, but I, I did it the other night as well, and um, it was actually I saw a lot more. Mm -hmm. But. <laughs> Let me just uh, try it here. Let me just first do something. <sighs> I know where I'm at. So I haven't had a chance to go and uh, use the interferometer yet. So hopefully this week will be the week. Last week I was actually down in Southern California and uh, um, sort of like went down on on Friday and went back up on Monday so mm. yeah so well, the plates all solved it so now I have to go outside and do the polar alignment I don't have it in a fixed place so uh... how does the plate solve work does it work pretty good yes. It works very well. So in the beginning, I had trouble with it, but that was also partly because I didn't understand ECOS very well. And the home position is important. So 
you have to sort of place solve near where it thinks it's supposed to be. So if you initially, it assumes the home position, at least that's the idea. But if you don't set it up right, then the, where it thinks it is, is is way off, and then it will have trouble plate solving. Okay, so in other words, it has a limited range of sky that it actually can yeah. look at and do plate solving. As... I think it can look over the whole sky, but it has several index maps, right? So for different angles of view, and it takes forever. So you really want to be close, and then then it's actually pretty quick. So I don't have any of the problems anymore that I had in the beginning, and I don't know what I did wrong, but I, I understand the system a whole lot better. So. It was probably my own. And why do you find that useful? Because, uh, well, uh, first of all, you, you can just sit behind your desk and uh, point the scope at wherever you want, and uh, it's it's very nice. So, um, but can't you do that with the planetarium program? Yeah. So that I, I use uh, the planetarium program that I say uses right here. This is uh, right uh, K stars. So um, you need to, but you need to. So for a scope for a mount, you have a go-to alignment and you've got a polar alignment, and both of them can be done by plate solving. So the first plate solve that I do is met, that I I want to make sure that it knows that I'm near Polaris, and once I'm there, then I'm going outside. I do three plate solves at different angles, and then it can um, it, it tells me exactly how to move the Alt and As controls to do the polar alignment, and that can be very accurate. So okay. and it's very quick. It's not like and you're uh, doing a you're doing a portable setup every night. Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm moving okay. my AVX outside, so sometimes okay. it's off by a few degrees. If I, you know, I try to aim it as, as best as I can, but uh, uh -huh. yeah, and if it's it's off by two two degrees, then you have to, may have to do it twice because the you know the field of view of the of the uh, camera is only limited, and it, it <laughs> works in the field of view. Hank, but did you say did you say you're using the uh, Celestron AVX mount tonight? Yes, yes. Hmm. Yeah, and, mm -hmm. and so after you're done with the polar alignment, then you do a few more uh, syncs with the, well, you, you clear it all out because after you've changed the alt and as, and of course the model is totally screwed up. So you clear all the sync okay. points and, and you do it again. And then uh, with two plate solves, that's accurate enough to get pretty much anywhere within the field of view. You do one more. So I go to a target. If it's um, a little bit off, then I do a go to, and then I do a plate solve sync again. Okay. And, uh, so so Hank. That long. But, what are you looking at tonight? For oh, plan to look at to do, to do the heart and soul. I'm I'm just not making much progress with the trouble that I had first swapping out my hardware. Um, sort of like a half-hearted attempt, huh? Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's uh, I'm I'm getting practice. That's that's the way I see it. I mean, I like fussing around with stuff. And so, um, but you know, I I had uh, oh I had a nice uh, Milky Way the other day. And I actually wrote a program that does um, uh, gradient removal, and that worked out really well. I can actually show that if I. Uh, cool. So, the way I did that, because you know, the, I don't want to buy picks inside just for, for you know, for most things you just need stupid things like like gradient removal and and minimizing the stars. Those are the most important things. The rest you can take care of with with any other, you know, editor like GIMP or uh, even uh, DSS. So um, what I did was I I, uh, uh, I selected in, in GIMP the area uh, where I wanted to do, do the gradient. So for instance, I, I cut out the, the, the Andromeda itself that I was taking. Did I say Milky Way? I, I meant to say Andromeda. Um, and uh, also the bright stars. So you can do that with masks and manual selection and so on. And you, you make the inverse mask do a multiplication. And that gives you exactly the, the area of where you want to estimate the gradient. And I wanted to do in such a way that everywhere where the value is zero, it's totally black, that it does not take those areas, but just the other areas. So I chopped up the whole image into cells. So I loaded it up into Scilab, which is like MATLAB. And uh, the advantage is that you can just do things much easier there than, than in Python or C or whatever. And so I chopped it up into uh, cells uh, based on uh, 10 data points per parameter. So you figure out the number of parameters. I decided to go with a fifth order Chebyshev polynomial. So that's 2D, that is uh, n times n plus one divided by two, that's like 21 or something like that, polynomials for a sixth, fifth order. And um, so I estimated that uh, uh, using just uh, standard least squares, just the backslash operator. I mean, really, the code is really simple. And then, and then um, you know, you calculate the gradient and it looked really good and I subtracted it and it, it did a fine job actually, so. <laughs> Um, I could show that, but uh, 
Uh, so you, you took a wide field view of the Milky Way near near Andromeda? No, no, he took uh, M32, shot of M32. Oh, it's M32? Yeah. Uh, so let me see if I can find a link so I can log on to my other computer where I can share it. But that was kind of cool. I, I now I've been spending quite a bit of time figuring out how to turn this into a GIMP plugin, and that that's the hard part. <laughs> so, uh, um, okay. What is that? Uh, a Pascal or C to to GIMP? GIMP is uh, it has uh, well, it's written in C plus plus, I think, hmm. uh, and the plugins are in um, C mostly. They also have plugins in, in some cryptic language that they have themselves. It's a horrible language. They call it .scm or whatever. But you can also uh, use Python. Python is very nice. So um, <clears throat> I think I'm signing on to Zoom now. All right. So, um, but um, so I have a lot of problems because it's Windows and it's meant for plot. It's mostly developed on, on Linux. And so Windows is a second rank citizen and doing it in Visual C++ is not the recommended method. So you have to first get MSYS going and, and whatnot and uh, all kinds of horrible things. And I spent like at least, well- Well, days. isn't there a Linux shell uh, CG win or something like that? And wouldn't that have uh, the C language inside it that you could use inside there? Um, so I have SIGWIN, but uh, unfortunately, SIGWIN does not talk to Scilab. Scilab wants Visual C++ or uh, MingW. MingW is the minimal GNU environment for Windows. Uh. And I just installed MingW, but well, I had the, the actually the 32-bit version going, but my the Scilab that I'm using, my favorite Scilab is 64 bits, and GIMP is also 64 bit, so I have, I'm trying to get the 64 bit Ming W. I see. Going and oh, okay, there you go. I'm trying to log on, uh, Tom. I don't know if uh, you see me somewhere, but. Well, we've seen something. Uh, <laughs> there's the heart and soul. Heart. That's not me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. Me. I'm using Stellarium. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Um, uh, that uh, program, that mathematical program, is that a Linux program that you're using or is that a Windows program? Um, it's uh, not... Scilab, Scilab is uh, cross-platform, as is GIMP um, and, okay. uh, and all the other stuff. Is that a Mathematica or MATLAB type of uh, it's, alternative? It's pretty much the, the poor man's MATLAB, but it's actually very good. It's uh, developed in, by the French and uh, Enria, so they needed some stuff for the, the, the Mirage fighters and so on. So, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, I think I'm- Well, that's there. interesting because uh, the um, that program uh, that the add-on to Excel that allows me to communicate with the digital micrometer that was developed by a guy in France who 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 admitted that um, he let his uh, Microsoft license lapse because he didn't want to pay for it so yeah so let me see if I can find it here GIMP so yeah so okay this has it so let's see here um, the original um, M31 that I had is this. And, um, so you can see it now, right? So you see a significant gradient here. Oh, yeah. Um, and so in GIMP, I created a mask, uh, which was like this. So I masked out Andromeda and all the bright stars. And then I inverted that value, inverted that, because you know GIMP has this pixel math. It's kind of nice actually for all the layers. And so you can you can multiply and add and subtract and whatnot, all kinds of things. So that's easy to do in GIMP. And then I multiplied that with the background, and the result is this here. So this is what I wanted to base the um, the gradient on. And you can tell I did the the um, I did this with a, a threshold. So if you do a threshold, everything becomes black and white. And so you can make areas exactly zero. I mean, that's how it made the mask. And when I made the mask, I did it in two steps. And you can see a line here, it's sort of like a polygon. 
it won't affect the final result because for the I, I do count all the areas that are black zero and I just take the average. So if there's more black, then the average will not be significantly affected. So um, anyway, so I did the interpolation with that program and um, the gradient looked like this, which is pretty decent, I would think. And then I subtracted it and I got uh, this here. So and that's quite an improvement. I think it's pretty neat, actually, that horrible gradient. Um, so let's go back to the original. It is, but let me ask you a question. Yeah. When you were at the stage, going back one more, when you were at the stage where you had the masks and the gradient was there, what if you just there? What if you just substituted a black frame for that and then put it all back together? A black frame for... Uh... Or this whole frame. Yeah, so uh, a black I mean, you want you want a black sky yeah, yeah, yeah. without then, a gradient. Then you'd have horribly ringing, ringing stars, actually. It would be kind of horrible, <laughs> uh, huh. I think, um, because you would totally, I mean, that, that is actually one of the approaches that I used in the past. So, uh, so you can actually, uh, what you can do is you can blur it out. Uh, so, uh, and, and then subtract it. Uh, if you don't blur it out, then, you know, the, the subtraction of areas where, that are completely black and completely blue, that gives a nasty discontinuity in the final image. So mm. that, that won't really help you. Mm. Um, Seems to me that ought to work. I'll give it a try. Yeah. I'll find something with. Yeah. So, so Hank, which telescope and camera did you use on this? Oh, this was the, with the AstroCat. Yeah. And this was a quick stretch. I did this in uh, DSS, and that gave me th this image here with the gradient. But in GIMP, I would have had the gradient just the same. It would just be a little smoother and so on. But uh, yeah, the quality is kind of all right. This is um, not full size, but if I open it up and, and you look at the detail, it's actually pretty good. So if I, I mean, this is not bad for a 51 millimeter. Now these these stars are a bit uh, stretched, of course, so they don't have much color. Only the big ones do. But uh, I mean, you know, the stars are round and very small. Um, and I think I could have got more detail if I had done this in GIMP, and I may do that probably again. But uh, yeah, this was about two hours of exposure, and I haven't worked too hard on it. Just on you know removing the gradient. That's what I have worked hard on because it's just. You know, if you, if you want to do gradient removal in GIMP, um, uh, the trouble is you can do it in GIMP, but um, you have to do it the, the way GIMP does gradients is it assumes a model where the gradient is built up from parallel lines. And um, it has a, a profile in the opposite direction. So you can have a circular profile or a linear profile. So you, you pick a beginning point and an end point, and you can also add points in between. But for that, Whatever you do, all these uh, the, the 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 gradient is actually built up from parallel lines. So you end up having to repeat it. You can do one corner first and then the other corner and so on. But by subtracting the gradient, you're also creating new gradients. So you have to you end up doing an awful lot of work. And something like this that that is does it just right in one shot is just highly desirable. <laughs> so yeah. So Hank, did you use the AVX mount with this uh, with the Astrocat? Yes. Yes. I mean, it's a 51 millimeter, right? So it's, uh, it should be able to do it. So yeah, if Very the light. Dining works well and everything, then uh, yeah, works fine. Oh, I so have to say, yeah, there was a bug in ECOS and I, I spent a couple of nights trying to figure out what was wrong with the auto guiding. It was not my fault. It was actually a bug in ECOS. Um, so I went back to ST4. So right now I'm doing ST4 auto guiding. Um, but I, I heard that it's, it was uh, fixed in a later version, but I did not uh, reinstall the AstroBerry. So I'm going to live with ST4 for a while. What is, what is ST4? What's that? ST4 is basically the on-camera auto guider. So um, these, these auto guiders, they have a, um, a light sensitive oh. uh, thing in there. Great. And it's, it's like an on off switch. Um, it's actually, it's yeah. named after Espig's uh, first uh, auto guider after, camera. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically uh, you send that signal back to the auto guider, and it 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 outputs a signal that goes straight into the mount to speed up or to slow down. 
So instead of doing uh, pulse guiding, which uh, builds it on top of the Go2, so that's totally different actually. Um, it, it actually, uh, so in this, with the ST4, the tracking is just basically at a constant rate, aside from auto guiding corrections and so on. But well, well, that's what it's about, of course. But uh, but the the uh, auto guiding is done by the taken care of by the by the mount itself, of course, with help from the feedback from the laptop computer. But uh, it's not built into the uh, pulse guiding itself. So you have you need one extra cable, and you can do it without the extra cable if you do pulse guiding. <coughs> then it just tells you know it just. Uh, does it through the go-to functionality of the pulse guiding? In in your guider camera, is that like the Orion star shot, or is that? Yeah, the SSAG. A lot of uh, auto guiders have an SD4 port. Thankfully, still the 120 Mini still has it. Um, it's it's practical. You know, if you don't if, if you don't want to depend too much on computers, then it's kind of nice. Um, well, for an auto. Well, if you don't want to depend on computers at all, you could borrow my ST4. Auto guider from this big. <laughs> Got the original one. Yeah, I guess the Lodestar or something is isn't that one guider that has it built in that's totally autonomous. There are some of those, no? No, I think. Yeah, yeah. but there are some. There are some auto guiders that don't re require a separate computer. Uh, I think does the last one have them? Anyway, I don't know which ones those are, but uh, well. People use computers so much now that it's not an issue. Is that your shot there, Hank? Oh yeah, that yeah, that was. Uh, uh, did you just uh, come in or? Yeah, I've been out there. I was, I was just trying telling. To get the scope ready. Yeah. You no, know, I, I did something with. Uh, so this was the original <clears throat> image, and uh, <clears throat> I wrote a gradient removal algorithm and it turns it into this. Oh wow! In one shot, and that, that works really well. So I that's kind of, like, neat. <clears throat> yeah. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. So yeah, I, I mean, just summarizing it. I, <clears throat> I first uh, created mask. <coughs> Sorry, I've lost my voice. <laughs> Invert it, then multiply it with the background. <clears throat> so now you've got a mask background, and I oh. take patches of it <clears throat> and fit a polynomial through it and <laughs> subtract it, and that yields to yields this. So this is actually the gradient is here. This is the gradient, and. Um, it is more flexible than GIMP because GIMP can only do gradients in one direction, so basically. <clears throat> so you end up doing a lot of work for nothing. But this worked uh, worked out pretty well. Oh. What did you take? Did you take that with the Red Cat or? Yeah, this was with the Red Cat. And um, the gradient removal was done in Scilab. Mm. So Scilab has a toolbox for image manipulation. So you can load a JPEG and it just becomes a three-dimensional <clears throat> matrix. It's actually eight bits because Scilab is smart enough to not waste too much memory. Uh, by default, it, it would be you know, doubles, which is eight bytes. But, uh, and Hank, that, grad that grading is caused by your street lights in your area? I think so, yeah. Um, I haven't pinpointed it, but um, yeah, I, I should try it with a shield. Because you know the neighbors across the street, they cause some light, and you know, I didn't know if I can't recall if they had the Christmas lights still on, but I strongly <laughs> suspect it was from there. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, yeah. Neat. All right, I'll go uh, back, try to set up, uh, do the polar alignment, and try to get the heart and soul tonight. So uh, let me just stop the share here. <clears throat> Dick, any oh, news on your uh, observatory shipment? Yeah, that's a good question. They were supposed <laughs> to have had it created Friday, and I haven't had a, a conversation with them lately. Uh, I had to go down and get the MRI today, but uh, I'm going to try and probably buzz them tomorrow and find out what's going on. Uh, you know, what's the latest story on uh, <laughs> where we're going to do this thing? So I don't know what's going on. Uh, it, it just comes and goes and uh, but I, you know if it's not here by the end of the year then I think I'm just going to have to cancel and go for something else so. but uh, you know I'm, I'm doing some stuff out there now I got uh, I got a few things done from uh, last time I could probably share with you guys if you don't mind sure uh, 
last time, uh, you know, I did that one of Cygnus uh, that was a 24 millimeter shot. So I went through and uh, annotated that guy. That took a long time. Uh, it just was difficult to find everything. But what I liked about it is, you know, you can see some of the stuff like the Cygnus loop kind of looks like a Liberty Bell with the 52 star uh, being the bell ringer. And uh, you can see some of the Saturn region. You can see the North American came out really pretty well. And uh, let's see, uh, everything is on there that I think that I want to have on there to this point. Um, I have some stuff, let's say, for example, this lobster claw region, I've kind of gone through that, done that pretty carefully. There's the cave nebula is in there. I've got some shots of that. So I, I'm going to try to probably try to put something together with this being, you know, kind of like what I did with that one with the constellation map and then some of the images that will come together with it. I'm going to probably try and do the same thing uh, with this uh, sort of thing here. It's kind of kind of what's leading into the book that I'm putting together. Uh, and uh, this is the latest one that I did just last week. And this is the one that has uh, Shedder, Cassipia, Cassipia, I should say, uh, as the center of it. And uh, I've always liked this view very much. This is the one that kind of got me started on these 24 millimeter views. And the reason why I like it so much is there's so much here. You've got the Andromeda galaxy here. You've got M33 down here. You've got the North Star up here. Uh, this is that C214 that I took with NGC uh, 7822. There's uh, IC 1396. There's double clusters, heart and soul. So that's all there. And so I'll probably do something similar. I've done this shot probably about, this is the third time I've done it, but this one here is, it's pretty much full frame, but there are some artifacts. Like, for example, if you get over here, you can see that the edges are not quite, quite there. Mm -hmm. There's a little bit of uh, overlap over here, too. Well, so Dick, how much, how mm -hmm. much time is, did you put into this one? These, there's about, I think there's probably about uh, 41 frames is what I'm going to say. And there are seven minute exposures uh, with the, uh, no, six minute exposures with the, uh, uh, 24 millimeter, it's a F1.4 Rincon uh, stopped to F4. Uh, and so uh, it, it didn't take a lot of, uh, you know, it, it took a couple of nights to, to actually compile the data. And then probably, uh, you know, four or five hours to do the processing and so forth. So it wasn't too bad. It was, it was a little bit of work. Now, kind of where I'm going is this location here. This is what I took with the NP1 or the uh, Red Cat. Hank uh, is going to try to do that tonight himself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Uh, well, I've got this much of it here with the NP127 IS, and it goes probably about to about where this line, where the heart nebula label is. So I don't get this little spire here. And then what I'm shooting tonight is going to be in between these. I've got some of this guy, uh, some of the soul, and some of the some of the heart. It's about thirty percent overlap. I went about fifteen to fifteen minutes in RA is the movement that I'm using for the scope for the field of view. That gives me about uh, seventy percent of the field of view is the movement. So that's about fifteen minutes. So there's about a thirty percent overlap. Uh, but you know what, I, I, with the weather, that's kind of the reason why I was a little bit late to the meeting is the weather has been so uh, weird that I haven't been able to really, you know, do a whole lot in that direction. So uh, I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to pull this off. Uh, I think I can probably get two out of three panels, but not all three. So that's kind of an unfortunate, that's the problem with the, with the weather, the way it is now, and you kind of have to take what you get. Hey, Mike, uh, were you on uh, Saturday night? Did you get any of the aurora that they predicted that was going to, from the sun, set off a big blast towards the earth? They were talking no, about it was it. raining. Uh, 
Yeah, Actually, hold a second. Days. Sa hold a second. Saturday, it was raining here, but I was down where you guys were. So yeah, I was in I was, Southern California. So I was thinking you might have a chance up there. Well, I was, <clears throat> I was visiting my mom. So right. And my daughter, uh, they took me my my daughter for my uh, for a present. Uh, uh, got me tickets to see the uh, Star Trek exhibit at the uh, Skirbo Museum. Hmm. And it's kind of interesting to note that most of the exhibit pieces, which is like the original set pieces and props and stuff like that, are owned by Paul Allen. By who? Paul Allen. Oh, Paul Allen. Hmm. He, he died, right? No, he's still alive. Paul Allen of Microsoft? Yeah, he, he passed away. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I think I heard of something about that. So, yeah. Why did he do that? <laughs> it, it, it killed him to spend all that money on prop. <laughs> <laughs> or his wife found out he spent all that money on props. No, yeah. Sure. <laughs> uh, but it was, it, it was interesting. Uh, uh, you know, they had the original, you know, captain's chair and the, and the other stuff. And I'll, I'll, I'll have to put some, put some stuff up on the, uh, the how are they holding year. up? You know, props aren't really built to last. They look pretty shop worn and cracked and all that. Yeah. Those, those switches aren't switches. They're just blobs of of uh translucent plastic you know it was really uh well, that's all you need in the future yeah well you know you would think they would <laughs> they had a couple of, of of toggle switches but they didn't even go in for you know buying push buttons or anything like that they could have it was just translucent globs of plastic and i'm disillusioned just, yeah <laughs> it was i'll i'll I, I, I don't have it on my computer, but next week I'll show you a couple. It's pretty, pretty cheesy. Um, but uh, the, 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 some of the models of the spaceship were really nice, um, uh, really well done. Um, and the costumes are pretty, pretty good too. That reminds me of that Saturday Night Live skit where they had um, Captain Kirk, whatever his name is, yeah. Shatner was on there, yeah. and and he had they had the fans out there and they were just all googling and goggling over him and he said, "There's just one thing I've got to say to you all, you guys out here, <laughs> get, get alive!" alive. Get alive. <laughs> I mean, I love the show. No disrespect, but yeah. <laughs> I thought that's just what remembered that. Well, you know what? I wasn't that into the show until um, I wound up uh, going into the Air Force at the SAC and oh. on the SAC base. It seemed like everybody in the barracks would pile in and have a and 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 we'd all watch Star Trek and we'd oh, all yeah. have a good laugh. You you know why? Because they didn't have a mission abort, you know, everything worked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I remember going down to uh, when I was a kid going down to the barber shop, and, and uh, the guys down there, the barbers, would all have it on there. They'd all have Star Trek on there, and I couldn't quite figure out why they were watching it. And then I realized that it was the outfits that the girls were wearing on the show that really oh, got yeah. me attracted oh, yeah. to that. <laughs> Oh yeah, eye candy. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, it was pretty good. Uh, you know, they they covered a lot of issues. Um, the Chinese in the ancient times would use poems and haikus as a form of protest, but in the case of this here, they they uh they tried to bring out things like um, corruption and government and uh, you know um, 
you know, race relationships and stuff like that, uh, um, discrimination and all that. Yeah. Huh. Pretty cool. I, I didn't realize this museum, uh, this it's cultural It's still going. Existing. It's still going. Uh, it, huh. well, I spent a couple hours in it and then I went through the, the main part, which is about uh, Jewish history and, and stuff like that and culture. And it was... Uh, to, to me, it was also pretty interesting, but uh, this had a lot in there. This looks like the Getty Center. And that's, boy, that's huge. That's fancy. It is. Yeah, I, I, I didn't go to anything but the... Uh, uh, the uh, the exhibits the that's a pretty big place I didn't realize it really big yeah boy that's a lot more than getting a life I'll tell you that much yeah I didn't see most of that that's for sure that's uh pretty impressive very. So what city is this located? It's it's right off the uh, 405 at the Mulholland turnoff at the top of the hill. Hmm. A lot about, uh, you know, like that there, that's a, a replica of the um, main uh, synagogue uh in um in germany i think it was in berlin or some other town and it survived the nazis but it didn't survive the bombing of by the allies uh, oh. that's, uh -oh. that's kind of a you know ir irony about it uh mm -hmm. but you know uh the, the nazis they didn't destroy a lot of stuff they just kind of collected it to, yeah they rebranded it well, they also wanted to, to say, well, this is from the imperfect people, you know, the, the aborigines, aborigines or whatever. But uh, I can see the 405 freeway here. Yeah, there you go. That is so many lanes. And you know Good what? Boy, people, it, it's still jammed and people huh. still go from the leftmost to the rightmost at the last moment. I, can't, <laughs> I just can't believe it, you know, but they do. <laughs> It's, you know, for a bunch of local yokels like me and uh, Robin, who, you know, we are on this two lane country road, you know, a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of people, but um, there's a lot of, you know, the, the main part is about the, the Judaism and, and stuff like that, but there was a lot of interesting for, for me on on some of the artwork and some of the other symbols and symbolisms that uh, the various Jews in the various parts of the world, you know, the diaspora, you know, you, you learn about how Jews were in France for like 2000 years and uh, stuff like that, the Chinese Jews, you know, they, they they were there when Genghis Khan was there, and uh, when you, you you know when you really start digging in the history of people, people were traveling all over the place. You know, the Indians were all over the place. The the Muslims were traveling back and forth there, and so uh, it, it, it's it's kind of interesting because usually with these countries, people learn only about the about their people being in the country, you know, not being abroad, you know, you know, so. Seems like uh, I, I just saw a show where in China that there was like a Jews came from somewhere and they got saved in, in China. And then there's a the yeah. Japanese came in and that was yeah, quite, took a, them. quite a deal. There, it was like a very poor ghetto section they had to live in there too. Yeah, okay. Jews were were confined to the ghetto. Um, you heard of the the term "beyond the pale." 
that's that's uh, that's a term when uh, Jews immigrated to from from Europe, from let's say from Spain and and other places like that that they were kicked out of. 1492, uh, Columbus sailed the blue and uh, um, the Inquisition and all that, but um, they were uh, in a place, I think that was called Pale. And um, so mm -hmm. when a Jew was outside of it, for whatever reason, reason he was beyond the Pale, which meant uh, at a place where you're, you, you, you're not normally there you know you're you're traveling outside your 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 normal sphere of influence but it, it was it was it was kind of interesting um how they they survived um the, the the germans weren't the only ones believe me um but uh anyways um well, you had the Spanish Inquisition too. That wasn't a lot of fun. Oh yeah, yeah. The conversos <laughs> and a lot of Jews. the the first The first um, synagogue that sprung up in the New World was in Brazil by a bunch of Jews that some conversos that made it out of there, and then went back to their Judaism. And uh, um, when they got eventually kicked out of there because of the the Spanish influence, a bunch of them made it to New Amsterdam. And uh, the people in New Amsterdam didn't want the Jews there, but <laughs> they somehow got permission and set up the first synagogue uh, before the birth of this country um, in, I think it was Maryland or I forget well, what New state Amsterdam it was. was the city of New York. Before. New York, yeah. That's right. But, uh, well, the Dutch, okay. Well, the that thing is, is that, yeah. okay, well, the Dutch had, I believe, Brazil first, and they, they got taken over by the Portuguese or whatever. Okay. And so they were not tolerant of the Jews. And so they went to the other Dutch colony, which was New Amsterdam, right? New York. Right. So, uh, but it's 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 it was kind of interesting, but um, some of the customs that we don't normally do now, um, some of uh, um, some of uh, things like a modesty veil for women, which basically was in front in front of here where it was some sort of saying um, special gowns for circumcision uh for the for the boys and uh other things that just aren't done nowadays just because it, it's a different time you know it's just like when you think about the original you know we don't slaughter any uh Deep. any cattle and, yeah, and or, burn them up and all yeah, that yeah yeah although or grandma coffee. might might burn up the, the beef just because she wants it well done but uh uh <laughs> Uh, you know, things like that, it changes. Well, you so, don't have the veil anymore in the Holy of Holies. Do you still do that? You don't have any place like that anymore. No, no, there's no such yeah. thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's why we have synagogues. Synagogues take yeah. the place of it. Yeah, they and, take the place of that. Yeah. And, and, and certain prayers are in lieu of whatever sacrifices that, they, you know, they, uh -huh. you know, they, they change things. <laughs> so, Hank, yeah. how's it going? Uh oh, dang! I left the Batinov mask on. Yeah, I had to refocus. <laughs> uh, the Batinov mask works really nice, actually. So, um, I'm also, to... I'm getting a lot of dew right now. So, yeah, I, don't I got my dew protection already on. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> it's not going to last very long. So. Yeah, I put the big strip heater. I think I got like about an 17 or 18 inch strip heater for the for the MP127 because that thing's got so much thermal mass. That I just really have to pile on the heat. I go up about two thirds of the way on the on the uh, scale, yeah. but the uh, the guide scope uh, I can use a small strip heater on that one there, and usually get by with a quarter of the scale. 
Hank, are I you? I don't need any, but uh, because uh, the AstroCat has a very long tube on it at the front, so the, the lens itself oh. doesn't get any dew. Oh, okay. And the auto guider is fine as well. It's just I leave those those lens caps on the car, and they get soaking wet. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But the rest is the rest is kind of okay. Uh, yeah. So I'm gonna let me just get the buzzing off mask. See, off. that would not happen with an observatory. <laughs> yeah. Well, you probably still could get some, but it wouldn't be nearly as light. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like if you're pointing that, up, that's the only good thing about a, a dome observatory it tends to reduce that. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave a little early tonight. I'll okay. see you guys next week. Okay. We'll okay. Bye, Jerry. Bye. I gotta go. Pretty, I'm gonna go out and refocus pretty soon. Hey, 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 Dick. Dick, I wanted to mention to you. There's this. Uh, have you ever heard of Doctor Sarno? Uh -uh. Doctor Sar Sarno is. I'll show you this web page. Okay. And he, it's about. Uh, he has this uh, thing about you know people getting uh, hooked on the pain of the of your back or whatever. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and it's and it's really it's he kind of has a way of breaking that uh, link so you're you know, you somehow you can make your back pain uh, go away. I, I I don't know. I wor it worked for me one time. Now, what it, is he doing? Is it is it actually? I think actually, I think you're actually kind of talking to your brain. Oh no to, way! To refocus, oh. to refocus yourself away from the the pain, and it's oh, amazing. Wow. He 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 showed things like people had these slip discs. You know, the discs were way out of way out of line, and and they didn't have any pain. Oh, wow. And he, he he wondered why that was, and it was just that the 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 person somehow blocked that, that block. yeah somehow psychologically uh -huh. or the brain somehow blocked that for them oh, after wow. some point it, it didn't get locked in uh -huh. and so but anyway I I just want to mention that it's it seemed like a possibility that that is that works, possible works yeah. for some people you know and the yeah. other thing too is bob was mentioning those shots and 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 i know another person that mentioned those to me just recently uh about the shots too now these shots that they give yeah, you bruce pregnazone yeah, and bruce so i think the, yeah they the, only the, i'm sorry they only last so long well that's just it and that's what i'm worried about mm -hmm. i want to have something that's a permanent solution but i guess they say that you know it can help you get over it and the thing I found about sciatica is once you get it stirred up, that's when it, you know, it's hard to get it settled right. down again. So the, the secret that I, and sometimes I'm guilty of it, you do certain exercises, you build up your core muscles. That's and, what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the, the problem is, is that when, when you have the sciatica happening, it's you're, you could, you know, stir up a little bit of trouble it's sort of like you need to do it before it happens yeah exactly that's what i'm trying to do is get proactive on the whole thing so i can yeah. you know it won't be such a big deal this time yeah. yeah so we'll see how the mri comes out that that i did that today so oh okay yeah yeah well at least you're not laying in bed like the last time yeah, well, you know what I found is that actually laying down on that mat is that I was getting a lot of ridiculous pain in the calf area. And when I sit, I don't get it there. So I kind of have to trade off, you know, back and forth because then what happens is my butt starts hurting when I sit. So I could go back to that position there. And uh, I'm not doing too bad. I, I'm hopeful that I'm I'm making a little progress. What about walking? Does that help? Oh yeah, I'm all? doing that. I'm doing yeah. that. I stop yeah. cycling, and I take these little walks on level ground. I don't go up hills or any downhill stuff. I'm just trying to. I'm just basically trying to get myself into a synchronized walk, so that I'm in a rhythm. And uh, they say that's better than doing yard work, which I found that out the hard way. So. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got to go check focus. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. So, Mike, did you have any Windy Skies Observatory meetings at all? Uh, one's coming up in about a week. And a week. what I'm going to be talking about is uh, through my mind, I, I told everybody to get some paper and pencils because we're going to go learn and practice some drawing of, uh, you know, 
of, of planets and, and other things. So I'll go through some rudimentary drawing things, you know, like I went and where is it? Oh, my camera's on it. Uh, so I meant to do this before. And of course I always get too busy. So for a couple bucks at, uh, at uh, Walmart, you know, you've got the, your pencils, you know, a couple of uh, things of uh, graphite and some, you know, rubbing things, although you could just use a Q-tip or something like that to do it. And we'll go, we'll, I'll go over, you know, sort of like the, the steps, so to speak. So you're saying, you're saying to telling people that just do a drawing. You don't need an astrophotography camera. You just... Just do a drawing. That's right. Yeah. And I'm going to go through the history of it. You know, I'll, I'll actually, uh, I, 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 in my mind, it kind of gelled today. I'll go through the history. I'll go from like ancient times, you know, prehistoric. And then what I'll do is I'll bring up the pictures that of the moon that John Her Harriet did and Galileo because the, they, the, Basically, they were head and head as far as who saw the moon in a telescope and drew it first. Okay, Harriet beat beat Galileo by uh, about a month or so, but never published. And uh, you know, I I I covered that, and I think I probably told you guys about that. I don't remember uh, that. That it's it's I don't remember ever hearing about that. Oh, that's so it unless. It, was yeah you know, maybe it was one of the little talks you gave us uh, yeah it was it was a little talk uh, Harriet was the guy that worked for Sir Walter Raleigh in the colonies he was a cartographer and uh, oh, a naturalist yeah. okay oh yeah and so fortunately he got uh, associated with Guy Fox <laughs> and almost lost his life but Galileo was more of an artist. And you take a look at the the drawing that Harriet did, and it's more accurate in a way, but it's not as it doesn't have as much impact. So, sixteen oh nine. Yeah. And that drawing there. Yeah. So. Uh, Jupiter you know, stars. I, yeah, Harriet. Harriet uh, did that also, but he just didn't publish. He was he's trying to get out of prison. Did did they both have the same type of telescope? Yes, they had a refractor. They both had small refractors. Harriet um, bought his while Galileo made his own. Uh. So one wonders whether Harriet's telescope was a better performer than uh, Galileo. It was yeah, a lot, of, a lot of detail. Yeah, right. L like you would if you were like um, drawing a map of Virginia, which they colonized. He was on the first ship to colonize that. And uh, he, uh, his bosses, uh, the, the next you're you're getting out of there because I hear there's trouble coming and so <laughs> he he had other things for him to do so um, so it's kind of interesting so it looks like Thomas Harriet yep oh Thomas Harriet yeah okay did I say the wrong name I probably you said John yeah. yeah okay well you know at least I got the last name, but it's 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 kind of interesting how things, you know, it's it's almost like Newton and Leibniz, you know, uh, coming up with calculus at about the same time, you know. So I'll have them. I you know I think the moon you know, in binoculars is a great subject or uh, the moon with your own eyes is a, is a great subject for people to learn how to go and draw a planet or something like that. Yeah. 
we, where the steps would be, you draw the outline and then you, with a thin pencil, you draw the major features and then you start filling it in, you know, a little bit later. So I, some t um, we did this at the VCAS, oh, about 30 years ago. And it was kind of interesting how some people really had a good knack of, of getting stuff on the paper, you know, a, a really nice picture of, of whatever it was. So uh, uh, that talk was given by uh, uh, Tim Robertson, uh, uh, ex-president, uh, um, and he was sort of like part of the ALPO, you know, and I think if one wanted to learn how to, to draw, going to the ALPO would be, uh, website would be a good place to go to. I, I would imagine that they might have uh, some uh, decent how-to details on it. And you're probably going there right now. Yep, there you go. Seeing if there's there's a lunar and planetary training program. Gee, this. Oh yeah, that Tim's been. I think Tim's still doing that. He, that's been a long time. He's been doing that for a long time. Yep. Nope, yeah. Can't blow that up. Let's see if I open an image, a new tab, and then I try to blow that up. So that so the step is is that you make one drawing where you put all the features on the other one, you, you kind of fill in what it's supposed to look like. Huh. Now, the thing That's is, true. is that, the thing is, is that, um, you know, this, this did arrive at time before, you know, CCDs and stuff like that. Okay. And one of the things that are some of the the ALPO people was, is that when I came up with some of my first images of uh, Mars and all that, it was pretty good. It, it had a, a lot of detail and. Um, Simi so Valley, for, yeah, still there. Here, Rahada, oh, okay, he's moved. Oh, hold a second. Oh, go back. Yeah. Oh, that's that's his apartment. I thought he got married and moved on. That's weird. Maybe they didn't update that. Yeah, maybe. Oh, contact. Let's see oh, if we can contact. Here, here, executive director. So, oh, down here. Well, it still shows the apartment number. Okay, maybe maybe she moved in with him. Well, wow. okay, there you go. He's known as Comet Man. Oh yeah. Comet but, News. But uh, doesn't uh, uh, Tom Whitmore doesn't he have Comet in his uh? email address or whatever oh yeah he, his starts with a letter k cometes yeah 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 using the latin version yeah that's because tim probably was into tim was into the internet a long time that's interesting his scope there that's different than this one yeah explore first light there's no dew shield it's a uh, Moxitoff. That's, a... That's what I was thinking. Yeah. 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 Well, Tim. Tim was a. Tim was wholly into refractors for the longest time. Hmm. Oh my gosh, I haven't seen his face in a ton of <laughs> ton of years. Oh well, there you go. We all change. <laughs> little by little, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So good to see some pictures here. Holy smokes, look at this big tube. <laughs> yeah, a refractor. Long focal length on that one, I bet. 
You think that's a refractor? Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's huge. Now, that that shoot that looks of, like it's eight inch it's eight inch and look oh, at that wow. now that's uh that looks like a it's i think that's what's the size bigger than the 1200 <laughs> uh astrophysics oh you mean the 1100 yeah yeah there's no, a it's 1600 a big, there's a 1600 i think that's, and that's a, a 220 pound payload yeah well yeah that looks like you'd need something like that too Oh, and look yeah. at the rings, how far apart they are. Oh, Shoot. yeah. You probably got what, be... a couple of feet. I wonder if this is a solar telescope here. No, no, that's a, it looks like a refactor. That that reminds me, I got to go and resurrect my uh, eight inch uh, Dal Kirkham. It's, it's an eight inch F20. Boy, I hate to have to set that sucker up. That thing would must weigh a ton. Uh, which one? That, that one? one that we were just looking at. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's probably over 100 pounds for yeah. the two. I mean, it would be That's nice cool. to have the astrophysics mount. That Now, the one that I'm getting, I think it breaks down into 22 pound, no more than 22 pound components. The two pieces. Really? Yeah, it comes apart. It comes into two pieces. That's yeah. one of the yeah. features. I wish my Misu did that. It's yeah. 55 pounds. Yeah. It's not e it's not easy to to move about. The good thing is still my back is still good. I um but when I yeah. lift it, when I lift it now, I I need to make sure that my back <laughs> is properly aligned. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't bend over. <laughs> oh, geez. Or twist. Yeah. The, twist the worst either. thing is twisting with the load. Yeah. Well, if you if, the other thing too is you don't want to overhang the load. You yeah. know, if you got your arms way out like this and you got a load, then that yeah. would be out of alignment. <laughs> yeah. 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 Make sure you move your feet. Don't, don't well, move that your was back. I don't know if you remember from last week. I was talking about the fact that the, the guys at the Out As conference, they were all talking about building large telescopes um out of uh the meniscus uh thin mirrors so that they could lug around a 20 inch scope with uh when they were in their 80s so uh uh you know because a 16 inch not even a full thickness but like something like for a light bridge or something like that those the, the mirror itself weighs like 50 pounds mm. you know so That's they're talking good. about you know, a 20 inch mirror weighing 20 pounds or something like that. So, yeah, this, you know, this organization has been doing very good, uh, good work. You know, this is sort of like one of the, these <clears throat> in the uh, ABSO, you know, I've been doing a lot of citizen science for a long time. And some of the, some of the big people like Don Parker and a, a few others that are passed on, um, you know, were part of the organization and adding observations and stuff like that. So I see the Carrington event now. They they have something called Carring Carrington rotation. Hmm. I wonder if that's in reference to the Carrington event or was was Carrington a, a solar observer when that happened? Was that in 1856 or whatever it was? Maybe. Who well, was it? It was some amateur that actually recorded the rotation of either Neptune and Ur or Uranus for the first time, and he wasn't that far off. Huh. Yeah. So. Mission statement. Just studying. Too bad it's called Alpo. It sounds like a dog food. <laughs> I'm dog sure. Food. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, there's only so many letters. <laughs> but maybe somebody in Alpo did. Uh, made it made the dog food so he just said decided to decide, call it that 
Or maybe it, um, it was a guy named Al that had a poor dog that needed <laughs> some food. Very poor. Very poor. But, but, you know, nowadays, you know, the drawing, I mean, it still has its place in certain circumstances, but a lot has been supplanted by video and uh, electronic astronomy. Um, it's hard to get that amount of detail like that solar thing you just showed yeah. um, in, in one try and like with uh, the, the Jup like with the Jupiter drawing Jupiter, you know, you spend a couple hours and it's already halfway turned around. So uh -huh. Dick, is, I think this astro bin is where you need to post your astrophotography. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, well, it's a great, yeah. great site. You know, the one that I did of, uh, the, of the North American is a good one, but you know, it's got the artifacts. I'd have to go, you know, I have to start all over again and hope that I could get it, get the, get it artifact free. <laughs> Let's see, what the hell explore the big office. Image of the day, image of the day. I do like the pipe nebula though. That came out, oh, that's cool. Wow, look at that. Flying yeah. bat and giant squid. That's the squid. Oh my gosh. That's so cool. How many hours or how many days worth of uh, yeah. energy? It'll tell you right here. It'll tell you about how they made it. Um, ZWO 12600. Uh, let's see. Integration 27 hours. Uh huh. Yeah. That's a lot of work. Well, the all filters. I mean, it's just so much work. Wow. Yeah. Oh, three. Oh. Yeah. Pretty. Very 27, pretty. 27. Oh, let's see here. 29 times 120 RGB. 58 minutes 20, and then 22 hours, 30 minutes for the 03. Yeah, because there's probably not that much of it. I was into Williams Optics. Floor star 91. Yeah. Uh, 91 APO. I've got a fluorite 80 millimeter. Uh-huh. Huh. So that's probably like what, maybe 400, 500 millimeter. Yeah. Mine's about five, okay. uh, 590 or something. Like it's a, it's an F7. Wow. That's beautiful. That's gorgeous. Yeah. Lots well, of work. Oh yeah. Here's full resolution. Nice. Beautiful stars. I wonder how many hours at the computer, too. Oh, you mean <laughs> the processing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I wonder what he did. Or did he say what he processed it in? What did he use for processing? I don't know if it says that. See if he has any information on. Let's see. Software, Adobe, uh, Photoshop, Ladies, Astrophotio, and PixInsight. So he probably did most of it with PixInsight and then the last yeah. little bit. Yeah, I would agree with that. And the reason why is you can't go back once you modify it outside of PixInsight. Uh -uh. Can't go back. So you have to do pics and site first, and then you can go. To your well, other. I think the reason for the long exposure times, take a look, he's using three nanom. Yeah, he's got three really nanom. narrow band. He's got, he's near, very narrow band exposure. So yeah, he's got 16 times four hours. So that's four shots per hour. And notice that he's using the, a, a, a stair uh, pro uh, so it's it's everything's integrated on top of his uh, telescope it's so it's all automatic so he's probably going inside and you know watching dancing with the stars while it's doing its thing what is what is this thing mike 
It's a computer. Oh. I, I believe it's, it's basically um, a Raspberry Pi with the. Oh, that's a ZWO thing? Accessory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's all integrated. It's set up for you. So you don't have to think about it. It's got the. Uh, the it's probably optimized for the ZWO stuff. Um, but uh, basically, it's what people are now doing. Uh, and if you notice some of the other brands of mounts, like the um, uh, some of the Chinese mounts, they have mounting brackets for a um, a Nuke, which is a a, a miniaturized Microsoft, uh, I mean Intel computer. Uh -huh. So this is this, this is sort of like a this, you know, uh, Raspberry Pi on steroids, I think. We would say the specifications. So, I mean, what is this thing doing? It controls everything. So, it in other your words, camera it controls your guide scope, it controls your mount, the mount, and, and probably and has a, I believe, a Wi Fi. What about your, focusing? Yeah, and a focuser. Yeah, the, controls all that. Does the focus, is that all automatic to focus or do you have to go out there and focus it yourself? Um, it can be automatic. Um, um, a, um, ZWO has a focusing attachment for refractors and uh -huh. telescopes. Yeah, that looks like a, a Raspberry Pi and they probably put a, a few things on there to optimize for their products. It's got an Ethernet port. So does that so have the ASCOM in it, or is it probably not using ASCOM? ASCOM Alpha. No, Alpha. no, no. This is this is probably like in the. It's probably what uh, Hank's using. Yeah. Or well, I wish they'd standardize on something so that we, you know, could go forward with the dog. Looks well, like this, this like designed this for like, Apple or Android. Um, I think that's okay. Think of it this way: um, Hank's using his computer with VLC. That's remotely logging into the um, Raspberry Pi from a Windows VLC to VLC on the on this here uh, on the uh, on the Raspberry VLC. Pi. These are probably have something similar, but for iOS and uh, for phones. Yeah, well, the, is this the uh, ZWA? Yeah, uh, yeah. The, that, that's it's basically the AC Air. Yeah. Um, it's basically the same as, as uh, this. Yeah. I, I believe it uses the, the same software. It has a different client interface. Right. But I believe it's built on ECOS. So yeah, um, yeah, I th that's uh, that's I surmised. And um, so it would be interesting to see if does the ECOS have a client for IO uh, for communicating with uh, cell phones or tablet. Well, I'm 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 uh, using it with the tablet and with the you know if you have VNC. Yeah, so I don't have an AC Air. I don't know what they put in there, but uh, you know, this is just standard uh, Unix, Linux stuff. But could you use an iPad to communicate with uh, Ecos? Yes, yes, you can. Add, uh, VNC runs on anything. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, and so and this is not Ascom. This is uh, all Indie. Yeah, Indie. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, uh, yeah. When you say you standardize on something, the thing about Ascom is that it's Windows only, and it's not even. Well, that's why I th think an Al alpaca because at least there you yeah. platform independent. And uh, not only that, you don't have to worry about being on a USB interface, you can be on ethernet. Yeah, I know, but it's just, Indy was there much sooner than, than Alpaca. So it's kind of I, uh, scary that- uh, Yeah, take, is, take, you know, take a scroll up to the cameras. I bet you they don't have QHY. Oh, well, let's see, they have DSLs. That's right. Uh, AS, well, yeah, the, well, yeah, they have, ASI cameras. That's right. That's the ZWO. This is a ZWO product. <laughs> you won't yeah. see, you won't see as big or, oh. or a tick. Is there a comp tick? competition? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. But for oh, ECOS, ECOS has everything. And so, by the way, the, the difference between ASCOM and, and uh, ECOS uh, and, and Indy is that I believe Indy adds the special features, whereas the ASCOM is more or less like the greatest common divisor of all the interfaces. 
So you'll see more. Um, yeah. India is a little better with specific, uh, the device specific stuff, whereas ESCOM is more generic. Yeah. And um, for well, I saw people is. making drivers for uh, with Raspberry Pi with the uh, Alpaca version of ASCOM oh, yeah. Yeah. drivers built right in there. So. Yeah, but uh, yeah, India has been around so long, so it's just oh. a shame. I mean, ASCOM sucked. You know. Yeah. Okay. It well, was. The, I, I, I. Yeah. And, I mean, and, what and, little uh, I've dealt with it, I haven't really liked it. Yeah. But. But it really held, held the industry back because, you know, it was, uh, it's not uh, distributed. So everybody had to run both the server and the client on, on the host computer, which is just kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, if we would have had a real distributed system, then we would have held all kinds of small devices on the telescopes themselves that are much smarter than what we have now, maybe, you know, <laughs> with a little bit of fantasy. Right, but, uh, right. Yeah. Okay, to find the difference between a server and a client, that, that the hub is a server, correct? The ASCOM hub. Yeah, so, so, okay. So the, the right now the client that I'm running um, is on, uh, well, I'm using it from my, okay. So you, with Ecos, it's a different story actually. You can, you can have a local uh, uh, PC client as well, aside from what I do. So right now I'm just uh, logging on to uh, the Pi. And so the client is actually there. I'm using VNC to, to log on there. Um, but the client would be the program that controls the camera, the mount, and all that. Yeah, so, and so, they, could be separate, they could be separate programs that communicate with a, the yeah. hub or whatever they call it. And that would be the server, correct? Right. So, so, so the, 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 the significant difference is India is a very lightweight protocol. It's XML over RPC. It's very simple. It could live on very small microprocessors, but DCOM is a beast. That's the old, uh, you know, it's uh, right now it's COM. COM lives on a, I mean, if you think about ESCOM, right? ESCOM is built on COM. COM is a, an interface that was invented around the 1990s uh, by Microsoft. And it lived on the <clears throat> desktop itself. It was uh, object oriented. That's very nice, but it was not distributed. So they added the D of distributed and it could live on <clears throat> several PCs across the internet. That was their idea of the distributed internet. So we've got all these objects that are all talking to each other and so on. But you have to run DCOM, which is a heavyweight protocol. And so that's the problem with it. It cannot run on small computers. It's impossible. Uh -huh. You have to run it on Windows and really powerful computers. Whereas Indy is a lightweight protocol that can run on very much smaller computers. So if, uh, you know, mm. it could have lived easily on, on a, you know, on an ESP. And thing. it uses XML, as you said, which probably was invented by what, Microsoft or something like that? Or? Well, no, uh, XML, uh, yeah, this, that's kind of trivial, but actually the DCOM uses, a, a, a it's a binary protocol. So it also has to translate all the, various Indianness and, and whatnot for different computers and so on. It's really heavyweight mm -hmm. and uh, it's very smart and clever, but Microsoft already gave up on it uh, in the uh, late nineties or so. And uh, ASCOM just kept going until, you know, two years ago when they started with Alpaca, finally we got some sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh. It's, it's just a shame. Um, well, anyway, we've got two protocols and in both Indy and uh, Alpaca are going to do really well, I think. And most uh, vendors will, will produce two drivers, but it would have been nice if we could have standardized on one. But Indy has been you know, distributed and multi-platform from the get-go. From the get-go, yeah, instead of Windows only, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, Alpaca is not bad, and, and the guy who wrote it is uh, is pretty good, I think. I mean, I saw some uh -huh. presentations from the guy, and it, uh -huh. it looks good, but nothing wrong with it. I'm going to have to go, guys. It's time you to guys, call it. Yeah, yeah it's you time. guys take care. Running out of things and, and, to say. and Dick, take a look at that, Doctor Sarno. See what you think, Doctor Sarno. I will definitely see what I can find out about that. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Okay. okay all right, guys. Bye bye. Bye. Cutting it off. Good night. Good night.